thanks for the introduction. First of all, from a local perspective, I'd like to thank everyone for making the effort out of their busy schedules to come. It's really good to see so many growers here uh, as an organiser and communicator. It's a, a struggle to get growers to come away to any event these days, so well, I take my hats off for you to uh, making the time and that you felt this was a worthwhile uh, event. Uh, secondly, I'd like to thank Kiralee for all the work she's put into this, the uh, dark horse behind the scenes. So most of my presentation, uh, Kiralee's put together. A lot of the technical work that comes through grassroots is all done by Kiralee. I tend to be the one that stands up the front and um, yeah, does, does the, the speaking, but uh, yeah, her, uh, her expertise is, um, is duly acknowledged. So my uh, talk is on crop competition. So Lisa outlined the, um, come down the front, anyway, outlined the, uh, the big six. So and a really a key part that we're seeing emerge in that big six, uh, we're all very herbicide focused and particularly agronomists, we get very herbicide centric, but there's so many other tools out there in terms of crop, um, I guess, manipulation with competition to help put pressure on weeds. So I'm just gonna go through that from a, uh, an emerging, farming system tool called the strip and disc. And, and I noticed how everyone was wriggling their seats when we started talking about disc seeders before. Well, this is gonna make it wriggle even more. So it's, uh, it's, it's stubble, it's, uh, it's high residue, but there's actually a, a proportion of growers who are making it work. And this is no means a comprehensive summary of any data. It's purely observations, but we're just gonna put it in the context of, of crop competition. So crop competition, uh, uh, this is, my opinion solely, but I think uh, quite a few of you would agree that the tide is, is changing a bit and uh, 10 years ago I probably would have been up here talking in, uh, in terms of wide rows, 12 inch uh, knife point press wheels, how we can get a lot of these pre-emergent herbicides to work. But as growers are making the change to the new machines, we see there's a subtle, subtle shift and, uh, and narrow is the new black. So people are becoming more and more accepting of, of going to a narrow row spacing and uh, putting up with some of the compromises that, that might bring. So I guess disc seeders, as people are changing, and I'll talk a little bit about this in my talk, and then for those who are going on the tour over the next couple of days, we'll get to see firsthand uh, growers who are investing in disc seeders back on, on what we might call ultra narrow rows. So uh, yeah, six and a half to seven and a half row spacings. Uh, and then on tine seeders, we're seeing 10 inch or the 250 mil row spacing become a little bit more of the norm compared to 12, 13 or 15 that we saw emerge a couple of years ago. So uh, I guess why is that happening? Uh, there's a whole raft of reasons and that discussion on the mix and rotate, I guess brought it home to me uh, this morning as well. So whilst we get very herbicide centric and herbicides do a great job, we wanna look at all the tools we can use to complement those herbicides and one of the, 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 big, the big levers is row spacing, crop competition. So uh, this is probably the, the one bit of solid data I'll have in my talk today. So I, I just get the feedback from the advisor updates at the GRC. I get a flogging because I don't have a lot of data at times. Um, but th this is solid data. And row spacing, uh, there is some comprehensive information from a whole range of sources across Australia. Probably the, the main one is um, the 1% higher yield per inch narrower. That's what take home message. It's a really strong rule of thumb and it's based on some, some solid science from uh, particularly Glenn Rothmuller in, in Meriden, WA. So you have 29 years of research data and you've all probably seen this many times and we'll keep bringing it out because it actually does work and it's robust information. So every 1%, um, sorry, every inch you go narrow, that's 1% higher yield. But the other thing here at a weeds conference is it adds uh, yeah, more crop competition. So there's actually less weeds able, less seeds able to set in, uh, in a, I guess, a, a dense crop where you've got crop competition. And locally, the E.H. Graham monograph, so that's a comprehensive document um, from CSU, Brendan Scott and the team. So there's over 160 trials in that document which highlights that uh, in wheat, barley, pulses, canola, that narrow rows contribute to high yield, but also they help compete with weeds. So it's, um, it's pretty synergistic. And it's part of this big six that Lisa introduced this morning. So the crop competition really fits into the, the double knock story, the pre-emergent package, uh, Rick, that uh, summarised so well. Crop topping, so that's a practice we've been a bit slow to take on in the east, but it's really gaining momentum as uh, spraying capacity uh, improves and uh, registrations allow us to do so. Harvest weed seed control, so we're probably a bit slower to take that up in the east than, than what's happened in the west, but it's, uh, it, it's getting its own momentum as well but diverse rotations, and that's probably 
put that in brackets there, it, it's something you want to emphasise in, in my talk today. The rotations probably drive some of the flexibility with particularly disc seeding and some of these uh, strip and disc type tactics. So without the diverse rotations, a lot of this becomes a lot more limited. And I know there's a lot of advisors in the room and, and growers as well that we work with. Uh, the industry pushes back because wide rows work. So there's some pretty sound packages around pre-emergent herbicide use. Uh, the cost of an air seeder on a 12 inch row compared to a, a seven or a nine inch is a, is a lot cheaper per row unit. That's, that's pretty obvious. Uh, horsepower per tonne is less uh, on wider rows. So that, that all works. And I guess it, it's up to me to uh, help um, outline to you why some of the alternative tactics might have a fit in, in your business. So narrow rows can work too. So it's just an example. I'm not saying if, if you're looking at going to a narrow row that you, you go the full extreme back to the six or seven inch, but even uh, here's an example from some growers at Madong on a fairly, fairly heavy red setting clay soil with um, some black ground as well. So they moved to an NDF disc on a, on a 10 inch row um, back from previous on 13 to third with their Gason um, knife point press wheel. So that pushing all the way back to sort of really narrow, but the, the system worked for them because of their soil type. So there's different, um, there, there's different ways to get narrow. It's not just the ultra narrow. So here's a photograph from the junior grassroots team sitting on a granite rock at Juni. So I, I guess I, I use the analogy finding Zen. So in terms of crop fulfillment, um, strip and disc involves three components to help achieve that fulfillment. So um, we're gonna talk about the disc seeding side of it the narrow row spacing side of it, and then probably the, the more recent addition we've seen in the system is the, the stripper front, uh, so the high harvest uh, tactic. And this is led by grower innovation, so it's, it's something we've sort of seen as we've been away on trips, come back and, and there's a group of local growers who are really making it work in their system. It's a bit of a challenge for mixed farming, so um, some, some are doing it in mixed farming, but it's largely continuous cropping. So the mixed farmers will cover off on some of that stuff later on with Tim and Ben Webb, but uh, this is for more intensive cropping, cropping systems. I guess we really want to understand each component, so discuss a little bit about the disc uh, system itself and then the, the narrow rows, how that fits into it, and then, as I say, go into the stripper front and then try and pull all those components together. So I think if you look at each one in isolation, and I'll talk about that uh, throughout the talk, it, 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 it sort of doesn't create the synergy or the value out of having all three together. So I've just got a video that Kiralee put together here from a grower who's been doing it longer than others in this area. So he uh, had a, a demo, Ben Beck from Downside. So uh, the first stripper front was um, three years ago and he subsequently purchased one. He runs a, a nine metre CTF system. So um, yeah, I'll just, it's, it's quite self-explanatory, but uh, I'll just run the video. Get a groovy music. <laughs> So that just outlines what one particular growing, grower is doing uh, with the narrow rows, the disc system, and now the stripper. So thanks to Kiralee for putting that little video together. Hopefully it was self-explanatory. But a, a big part of, of disc seeding is the, the components, and we've come to learn it's not just about putting a disc under a toolbar and opening, uh, opening the soil up to place your seed. There's a fair bit of precision and some detail that goes into that. But there's a few advantages of disc seeding. There's plenty of disadvantages as well, which I'll cover off on them, and um, there's probably most of the people in the audience have probably helped me out on that talk, but I'll, I'll go through some of the, uh, some of the advantages of disc seeding. Um, I, I guess the, the, the big one we see is a zero till, so the soil aggregates. So uh, I guess soil structure is something, we've been in no till for so long, and then previous to that, the direct drilling. So zero till is that next step. So it's basically trying to keep those aggregates, particularly on, on, on soils that are prone to, to slake or dispersion, so keep them together for longer, so they can inherently uh, hold moisture for longer. 
um, and exchange nutrients. So the, the, the soil structure aspect to it is, is gradual and, and the disc seeding side of it, we're seeing people have been in the system for, fift, for 15 years, their soils just seem to have the ability to um, stay together longer, particularly on some of those sodic, sodic soils. Retained stubbles, I, I say personally wouldn't be the main reason you go into a disc seeder up front, but it certainly allows people to retain more stubbles and it's more so the, the, the stubble from two and three years ago. With a time machine, we can get through last year's stubble pretty easily, but it's that rotting material from two and three years that, that creates the challenges. Uh, retained soil moisture at sowing. So this is quite a, a, a main theme of, of this talk is that the, uh, we're always sort of crying for more rain and, and moisture is a big driver of the limitation of being able to get crops up when we want it. So we're just seeing with the disc seeders, they can actually sort of start when they want. Um, and, and the moisture is not lost, so when the disc goes through, in contrast to a tine, we don't open the furrow up and, and have that marginal moisture which gets lost and it tends to hang there longer. So there's it, been a big shift in the industry and this is nationwide with the, the trend of calendar sowing. And the majority of clients we work for um, basically aim to be finished by the 15th of May, whether it rains or not. So you need a pretty well structured soil. That might be a bit challenging for some people in this room, but that, that's, that's become industry standard. That doesn't matter if you're putting 2,000 hectares in or 10,000 hectares. They've got that start date and that finish date. So we set the range of varieties and a range of maturities to, to match that window because there's just so much overwhelming evidence from people like Rowan Brill, James Hunt, that early sowing works. Uh, so we're, yeah, we've got to have a seeding system that suits that. So we want to sow early and no clods. So it just astounds me every year I look in, the, in some of these paddocks at people with tine seeders that are fairly aggressive and possibly we don't need to be going so deep anymore to break up some of that uh, subsurface compaction that, that we see that we did when we originally got into knife points. But the clods, uh, I don't know, does any, anyone sort of see more and more clods? Uh, after last year uh, it was quite, um, quite challenging with a lot of water logging but the, the clods are an enemy in terms of pre-emergent mixing and also soil structure, they just tend to fall apart a lot quicker. And I guess at the end of it allows narrow row spacing. So the Hattie family, as I mentioned before, with their NDF, uh, there's three big levers with disc seeding that we probably didn't have before. Is it the penetration, we were a heavy machine to help keep that disc in the ground, uh, a really, um, I guess, an effective firming wheel, so the, the little implement that goes in the furrow, we see here with the, the, um, the Fox family's new XL machine, and the last one is that crumbler wheel. So the bit that's actually just dragging a bit of loose soil back over the top. And, and those three things can make a big difference to the actually crop establishment and the results you get out of a disc seeder. Negatives. So um, I'll, I'll do a show of hands as well. There's probably plenty, plenty in the audience. I see Pete will help me out on this one. So there are plenty of negatives. And this is one thing I've learned from growers that have been in disc seeders and all credit goes to them. I, I'm just really lucky to hang around innovative growers. And, uh, and glean a lot of the information from them. So it is, it, it is a disaster if it's done poorly and every one of you in this room would have seen that. So here's an example of a, a 10 and a half metre header, um, a local grower that currently took a photo with the drone last year. So you actually see that, that spread width. So it's actually a, a, just a standard kit on a, uh, on a case header, um, not spreading that straw. So then we went back to that paddock this year and the crop establishment, be it a pulse or, or another cereal, we tend not to try and put too much canola back into, into cereal straws with, uh, with the dish system, but it, it's really causing um, a lot of hairpinning and challenges to get crop through it. So we've got to, got to sort of work on that harvest, uh, harvest practice first to get it right. So that chaff becomes fairly toxic and you see the product of that which is called hairpinning. So the hairpinning is the function of the disc pushing the straw into the furrow and placing the seed on top of that straw. So that, that's the enemy. We want clean, a clean cut. So it's like uh, cutting cheese on a, on, on a cheese board, on a, on a, on a, I guess a yeah, cutting board. Um, so that, to, to take that, uh, that chaff out of it um, and that sort of starts at harvest. So eliminating that, that hairpinning effect. Discs come at a higher maintenance cost um, so people spend more time and more money on maintaining discs, particularly as we know we want to keep the disc sharp, so we, we can't shy away from that. If you want to capture some of these benefits, there's, there's more money uh, involved. That varies between different units. And there's more insect pressure. Again, we see, particularly with one crop, and you all know which crop it is, we see problems with slugs, we see problems with millipedes in the presence of these background stubble lands. So there's, Probably a bit of innovative thinking got to happen on that too. We don't just lay down our tools and say, well, well we can't do this anymore. Um, we've done some occasional burning this year with some of the long-term growers. Um, we're looking at crop sequencing, so a bit on some of Rick's talk. 
Uh, canola after, after pulses works a lot better than canola in, into cereal straw. Uh, but just, yeah, canola is a, re a really challenging crop in terms of some of this insect pressure in these systems. Yep, mice, we probably weren't hit as bad. We probably tend to run a few more sheep over our stubbles to clean it up. But there, yeah, the mice, I mentioned that a little bit in some of the stripper stuff. But yeah, that is an, another issue as well. Um, that comes back to sort of header setup losses as well. But barley was a challenge. So, yep, good point, Rick. And there's less pre emergent herbicide options. So that was discussed at length this morning. The, 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 the discs create more challenges. But again, with some level of innovation and, and using soluble products, I think we can get our heads around it. And generally, uh, gentlemen prefer blondes, agronomists prefer times. So, could I have a show of hands? Most agronomists in the room would, would be, and be, be honest, you'd prefer times for a whole range of reasons. Yep, Pete's one of them, be honest. Yep. Tim, good to see. <laughs> have an opinion and stick to it. So, narrow rows. So, this is a photograph from one of Kiralee's trials a couple of years ago in a, um, a barley barley crop that yielded really well, but we know the benefits of, of narrow rows for all the reasons I've spoken about. Um, there were two, improving crop competition, but an added benefit of improving yield. So if people can come to you uh, and say, here's another three or 4% yield, people would be all over it. And uh, crop competition from narrow rows does help do that. And there's old work from um, CSO science, CSIRO scientists like Tony Fisher that shows the best way to shade a soil is with green crop. So it's not until you get to about 10 tonne is it Swanee, um, when you, of residual stubble that you uh, have the same shading effect as what a green crop can have. And you walk into some of these crops on 13 and 15 inches and th there's bare soil all year round. And if you've got a green crop on 9 inches, you get a lot more shading a lot earlier. So that's, uh, again, we're, we farm in a water limited environment, so that's, that's a pretty cheap way to, to create a bit more, um, uh, I guess, resilience. Erect cereals, so hind marsh barley was probably the biggest breakthrough we saw, so an erect cereal, so it captures light both sides of the leaf, uh, higher yield, but unfortunately the same effect. So we've got an erect cereal on a wider row spacing, we tend to see more room for, uh, for weeds to come in those, uh, in those inter rows. Um, I guess Trojan wheat is another one, so that, that you go to New Zealand and the UK, so a lot of their uh, cereal types are very erect, so we, we do lose some of our crop competition. And it's assist harvest weed seed control. So Dan Fox will talk a little bit about this, but when we have uh, narrow rows, uh, we want to push, push uh, weed seeds to, the, to the, I guess the upper canopy so we can capture them. Um, how often do we go in to see uh, canola that we were going to narrow windrow burn and the, the ryegrass has dropped and lodged to the ground. So if we can sort of force it to, to push up to the light, we can actually capture it a bit better in the harvest weed seed process. The next one is a stripper front. So this is uh, yeah, fairly, fairly new to us, but it's old technology. So as HB McKay, he's been doing it for a while, but it's, uh, it's, it's sort of in a modern context. It's um, built by a company called Shelbourne in, uh, in Suffolk in the UK. And it's a rearwards rotating, rotating rotor. So it's got stripping fingers. So just think of your, your open hand. That, that's what's ripping the, uh, taking the grain off the, off the standing um, stalk. So it's, it's not actually, uh, uh, cutting, cutting the stalk, it's just ripping the grain from the stalk. So it, it strips the grain from the head and 85% of the grain is threshed in the front. So as opposed to your, your standard cut, put it through the draper, up the table auger and into the header. So this is, uh, a lot of the threshing is done in the front. Uh, in effect, there's limited chaff through the header. So some observations. Any growers here have a demo last year of one or previous? No, a yeah, couple. So huge capacity. So the average uh, was between 50 to 70 tonne an hour, especially last year. Um, and Butterfield Beef over there, Warwick, where, where is he based? In the great southern region? But, yeah, it's, it's a, he got up to 100 tonne an hour in some pretty handy crops last year. So um, that, it's just phenomenal the capacity they can get out of this. But yeah, from average of growers we saw last year, between 50 and 70 tonne an hour. Less fuel, so up to 50% less fuel per hectare or per tonne. So some of it's even more. High harvest, so again, you're just basically going through, ripping the, uh, the grain from the, the, the uh, top of the head and uh, not processing a lot of, particularly the North American headers, they don't like a lot of chaff in the rotor anyway. So um, a lot of straw in the header. So it's, um, it's just basically putting grain through the rotor. Tight concave, high wind, sieves open. There were just a few comments I stole off Twitter from the uh, 
yeah, last year's comments where people use the, the, the stripper front. I won't get into the machinery stuff because I'm bound to be brought down by people that know a lot more than me. But um, tall stubble. So this is, this is one observation we've made is the amount of shading that that tall stubble creates compared to, I guess, in a lot of other stubble retention situations where you might mow it off at, at your desired uh, row spacing or even mow it off a lot lower and put a fair bit of chaff out. So we're getting more moisture retention with that tall, tall stubble that's sort of lasting over the summer. And another observation that some growers made last year is his ability to strip the weed seeds. So Michael Walsh, who's uh, from um, the University of Sydney now, who's been with Ari for a long time, is, is actually queen, keen to follow that up. So where the, the, uh, the stripper's pulling the, uh, the brome and the ryegrass from the standing stalk. So that, that's something we, we sort of hadn't heard of previous. We observed that in Canada with Michael Walsh. Yep. Go-grass, and we watched the shell ball work. And I was stripping it off. First reaction was it wouldn't, until we actually watched it work and marked go-grass in the county, and then wait till the header went, and then we did a count on it. Okay. Yeah, good. So, I was most hmm. so yeah, I think it works well for brome and ryegrass. Wild oats, uh, speaking to Ben Beck, he said it does tend to be knocked off a bit, which is a problem. Uh, here's an example from Dan, David and Kathy Fox at Mara. So it's 2016 Latrobe barley, uh, going pretty handy yield. That's just a pretty average crop at Mara, six and a half tonne. They'd be disappointed in that, but that's pretty good. Uh, case 8230 on a 12 metre CTF system. So the standard draper, um, Dan will probably talk a little bit more detail. I was doing 35 tonne an hour, 100% um, engine power at two and a half litres per tonne. So pretty, pretty standard sort of results. And just take note of that engine power number, 100%. So when things are fully loaded 100%, what often happens? Pressure, breakages, stress. The stripper was doing 70 tonne an hour and possibly higher, but um, Daniel will outline that later, but uh, one litre per tonne but only at 60 to 70% engine power. And that's an observation of grower that we were for made the other day. He tends to burn all these stubbles. He said that even in the absence of not having a, a, a dish seeder, that ability to harvest at that sort of capacity was, uh, was pretty exciting. So there's a few challenges like everything, there's pros and cons. So <laughs> uh, the big one is being able to get the grain away. So when you've got uh, yeah, 70 tonne an hour coming at you, what, what do you do with it? Um, and there's an example that Kiralee took of Ben Beck. So he actually hires a second chaser bin uh, when they're in some of those high yielding cereal crops just to keep things moving. So that's not for everyone and you all have your own ways of, of working that out. Everyone gets very opinionated on harvest management. That's the skill of the grower. They can work that out, be it mother bins, extra trucks or what. Grain loss at the front. And Mark Day, who's speaking later today, made a really interesting comment to me because they trialled one on a John Deere last year. That there was variations between varieties. So you just get a bit more grain loss with certain varieties that might be prone to shed. Um, so that was a good observation. And another grower at Urana had more mice in the paddocks where they had the stripper on last year. So um, yeah, the, the grain loss can be higher as that, as that stripper front hits, hits the top of the crop. Um, some other comments, there was a bit more dust. Um, some disagreed with this, but yeah, a couple of growers said they needed to blow the fillers down and the transmission a bit more than what they would be doing with the draper. And the cost of an extra, Front. So I'm really conscious of this, you're sort of seeing a lot of these new farming systems and a lot of new shiny machinery. So this is where a bit of innovation will need to come in, like having an extra front in the shed to, to do your cereals. So, um, and discussing this with some other growers, they're looking at syndicating their draper front to use on the, um, on the windrower. Um, but, but yeah, one, one front between two for windrowing and then they wouldn't have to use the, the draper and the cereals. But that's an issue. And then managing tall stubble. So obviously if you don't have a disc system, you're not going to be inclined to be able to um, yeah, handle, handle the stubble. So some fine words from one of history's greatest uh, philosophers and academics, Aristotle, 330 BC. Uh, in the context of all this, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yes? Just one question. How does the stripper front go if the crop's down? Amazing. The blue hoover, we called it. Yeah, it just seems to, yeah, Kiralee was in a crop that, uh, where we had the barley row spacing trials two years ago. So it just seems to be able to get the, uh, pull, the, pull the, the, uh, the grain from the bottom of the, uh, the lodge crop better than we anticipated. It is truly amazing, yeah. So that, we had our doubts, but it, it does work well. Good question. So yeah, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So if you take a disc seeder on its own, you take a strip front on its own, there's challenges, but when we seem to put them all together, 
And weeds struggle to compete, particularly summer weeds. They tend to sort of disappear, like heliotrope. Um, just doesn't exist in this system. And when you come into the uh, into the autumn, or oh, fuma tree and cape weed tend to tend to disappear. Good old south thistle. It's it's still still a part of it. But the weeds are a lot easier to kill in the uh, in the stripper system as well because they're fresher for longer. So. No, no, the, yeah, well, Bruce Harper's here, he's done a fair bit of spraying in it, but it, um, Ben just tends to, obviously you've got to set your boom height to where the target is, but with the tall stubble, but they tend to target all the same summer weed challenges, go, go early, um, get them while they're small. So, but they just tend to stay fresher for longer, that's, that's one thing that really surprises, how much easier they were to kill. But yeah, all the same rules apply for summer fallowing, go early, small weeds. And they weed stand taller in terms of the harvest weed seed aspect. So I guess the key to this is to start with low weed numbers, so don't go into farms that are yeah, full, full, full of, uh, I guess, pretty challenging ryegrass numbers. And crop competition involves more than just narrow row spacing, so we see the varietal differences, so like fathom barley compared to latrobe barley, um, I, I guess the, um, the condo wheat compared to something like korak, so there's, there's varietal differences within uh, crop types as well, um, that varietal vigour. The double break, so again, it's, it's the, the diverse rotations have a, have a big fit. And the soluble pre-emergence, which we've talked a little bit about in terms of the forum, how something like the, the Sakura and the Buta Sands might fit into it. Unfortunately, they're our premium products, so uh, having a, a, the rotation sort of built previous to that, so you're not having to chase high wheat pressures with uh, pre-emergence. And this is, I guess I had to get one all black analogy into this talk, because that effort on Saturday night was just awesome. Um, they, are, they are supreme human beings and the agronomy package that probably needs to go with this uh, I guess farming system of the stripper and disc is a bit like the all black attack. Their line speed, their defence, they just blow everyone away so you've got to be, com I guess got to be complete and com comprehensive and on the front foot all the time so it's about your line speed when you're, when you're looking at that agronomy package and that involves uh, all the things we're talking about including crop topping and, and harvest weed seed control. We still need data to quantify these observations, so I fully understand that. John Kierkegaard with the new farming systems project that's kicking off across four sites uh, in southern and central New South Wales, so um, yeah, that's, they're going to actually incorporate some of this work into, the, into that analysis, so that's, that's a good step forward. So take home messages, strip and disc, innovation is not without its challenges, so these are growers that have, uh, yeah, that, that they haven't got it completely right, but uh, the, it, it's pretty exciting what we're observing in terms of soil moisture uh, and, and then the crops that are following. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So yeah, disc systems have sort of, I guess, bubbled along for a few years, but until we sort of brought the stripper in with the narrow rows, uh, we're, we're sort of seeing this synergy emerge and um, the, the results that I've talked about. It requires a me weed management and agronomy shift. So the agronomy needs to change with it. So targeting higher plant populations in cereals, for example, because the, the shading effect also is a little bit detrimental to the crop. So we need to target more, um, I guess, crops with a higher number of primary tillers as opposed to secondary tillers. So plant populations where you might work on 140 to 150, we're now talking 180 to 200 because we end up with a lot more primaries and less secondary. And really we're looking at visiting other growers and that's what this whole forum is about. So um, how it can adapt to your system yeah, I'm a purple in this room, so that just that does not interest me at all. But I guess when you go to the footy on a Saturday and someone's saying, oh, it's bloody dry, isn't it? And I just knew two days ago I was in a paddock where the, uh, had the moisture probe on with one of these growers and it, I got the full stick, like the mud, mud on the stick, pushed the handle. I said, well, it is dry, but there are growers out there who are innovating to manage that. So um, we can't just sort of put this stuff at the back of our mind so it's not for us. I think we've really got to innovate around it. And... It, it does look ugly. Uh, you see these tall stubbles at sowing time and it's, it's a bit wild and out of control, but um, yeah, the results, results are pretty positive. Thank you. Is there any further questions?